Good morning. Let's open up uh, this morning's service in the blue hymnal number 176. Number 176, break down the bread of life. And if you could please stand, 176. disciples in Emmaus and the scripture says and in the breaking of the bread their eyes were opened and uh, that's when the Lord is pleased to make himself known when his word is is broken open and uh, and he gives to his people a broken spirit contrite heart I want to read a couple of verses from Isaiah 66 if you'd like to turn with me there Isaiah 66 verse 1 <clears throat> we often speak of the truth that this is where the Lord is pleased to make himself known. But it's not because of the physical location. It's because this is where the gospel is preached and God's people are gathered together. Those are the two necessary elements for the Lord to bless. is for Christ to be lifted up and for his people to be needy. And so in Isaiah 66 verse 1, Thus saith the Lord, The heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things hath my hand made, and all those things hath been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him 
that is poor, poverty stricken, don't have anything, or to have no righteousness whatsoever before thee, and of a contrite spirit, and uh, trembleth at my word. Might the Lord be pleased to make us poor, contrite, and to give a trembling fear to his word as he speaks to our hearts. Uh, we have a special blessing today. Norm Wells and Nancy are here uh, with us uh, visiting uh, grandchildren. And I've asked Norm to bring the, the message the first hour. So, Norm, if you'll come, please. <clears throat> May we pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, it is such a delight to come before you this morning in and through our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that through him you are approachable. We come boldly to the throne of grace through the blood and righteousness of our Savior. We pray your richest blessings upon us this morning, Lord. We come desiring to be as was read to us we desire, Lord, to come with a contrite heart, a broken heart, a broken spirit, and a dear reverence for your word. Bless us as your folks, your people, your children. And we pray, O oh God, it be pleasing unto you this day to call someone out of darkness to your marvelous light. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It is such a delight to be with you this morning, and I would ask that you turn with me to the Gospel according to Leviticus. The book of Leviticus, chapter 10, this morning. Leviticus chapter 10. A number of times I've left Oregon and people says, oh, you're going to go down there and go to uh, this park or that park or this thing or that thing. And I says, I go down there for two reasons, my family and my family. <laughs> Those parks don't mean a thing to me. I did go to Cape Canaveral one time and enjoyed that because I witnessed some of that stuff. The book of Leviticus chapter 10, and I would like to read this morning the verses 16 through 20. Make a few comments on that. Leviticus used to be a book I would speed read through. <laughs> some of it is just difficult hard reading and when I was doing my daily Bible readings I'd come to the book of Leviticus and I'd do five or six or eight or ten chapters at a time because then I got through it and several years ago I read a book that said Leviticus was written to sinners and I wanted to know what that meant so we've been spending about two and a half years in the book of Leviticus in the Dalles and the folks said I've been blessed so I hope this is a blessing to you this morning as we look at an interesting passage of scripture that oftentimes I skipped, I passed over, but one day it, I stopped and read that and I said, there is something there. And I looked and looked at it. I want us to remember that as we read any of the Old Testament, the Lord Jesus said, particularly with regard to the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, Moses wrote of me. That's what he shared with some disciples. And he shared that with the Pharisees. And he shared that with those who were around him. Moses wrote to me because it was a common reading to them. And if you believe Moses and the prophets, you'd believe me. So Moses and the prophets have the gospel in them. And here we go this morning in this passage of scripture. Moses is often looked at as a picture of the law. We are used to looking at pictures, types, and shadows as we read through the Old Testament it's filled with them, and the Lord used those. Some of the books were written in, in verse, in poetry, and poetry has figurative language. And as we read through these books of the Old Testament, much of it is figurative language that points to some aspect with regard to the Lord Jesus Christ and his great saviorship and what he does and how it was his blood that was necessary 
to redeem his people from their sins. It is his blood and righteousness that we depend on now for our entrance into the presence of the Lord. So Moses shares with us here in verse 16, And Moses diligently sought the goat of the sin offering, and behold, it was burnt, and he was angry. That was the first thing in this passage of scripture that struck me was Moses was angry. And he's angry with two sons of Aaron. He is angry with something that they did not do. And he was angry with them with something that they did do. Moses is angry. Now, if you can ever find a passage of scripture in the law that is comforting, you are, you're mistaken. The law is wrath. That's all it is. And Moses represents that in this passage of scripture. Now, to you and I, there's little significance about what he found problem with. And we may just say it's just a trifle, but it was God's word that was broken. And God's word would stand whole. He would make it accountable. They had done something that was unacceptable, and Moses was able to point it out. He was angry. He was angry with something they didn't do, and he was angry with something that they did do. He was angry with Eliezer and Ithamar, the sons of Aaron, which were left alive, saying... Now, it's not long previous to this that we have the two brothers slain by fire... And it was interesting to find out that their clothes were still intact. He consumed them inside of their high priestly garments. Their clothes were intact. So there's two brothers that are taken, two brothers that are left, and Moses is angry with them. Now this is more than an uncle's anger. This is the law's anger. It goes on to share with us, Wherefore, have you not eaten the sin offering of the holy place, seeing it is most holy? So they had not eaten this offering as it was prescribed. They had burnt this offering instead of eating. Now we'd say, that's just a trifle. My goodness. But there's much said in the word of God with regard to even our sins of ignorance. The book of Leviticus If you would back up with me to chapter 4 for just a moment. Chapter 4 of the book of Leviticus. We have here that there are a number of offerings that were made just because of the sins of ignorance. One person wrote in someone's bulletin recently, and I put it in my bulletin. I think it was Augustus Toplady. That by breathing we are sinning. And he went through, and I figured it up. When I'm almost 68 years old, that means every second I've committed a sin against God, that's 2,144,448,000 sins I've committed by breathing up to this point in my life. And some people say, if I have good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, well, we've got somewhere to go. It's impossible. All right, Leviticus chapter 4 and verse 2. The scriptures share with us there with regard to this sin of ignorance. Leviticus chapter 4, verse 2. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a soul shall sin through ignorance. It's worse than we thought. Sin of ignorance. And it... Six times in chapter 4 and chapter 5, it brings up a sacrifice for just the sin of ignorance, not alone those other sins that we commit. So we have a problem, sins of ignorance. These two boys did something, I think, probably in ignorance. Their brothers have just been consumed in front of them. They've been taken aback a little. And so they did something that they shouldn't have done, but I don't think that they planned to do it that way. It just happened. They did it in ignorance, and yet the law was still angry with them. Moses, their uncle, was still angry with them. He was angry with them because of what they had done and what they had not done. 
as we read there, wherefore have you not eaten, verse 17 of chapter 10, wherefore have you not eaten the sin offering in the holy place, seeing it is most holy? And God hath given it you to bear the iniquity of the congregation, to make atonement for them before the Lord. Behold, the blood of it was not brought in within the holy place. Ye should indeed have eaten it in the holy place as I commanded. Now, again, I'd say there's a whole lot about this I don't understand. I'm thankful I don't live in that economy. I'm thankful I don't, didn't live back then. I'm thankful I can live now. The most that we do is offer the Lord's Supper or baptism. That's the ordinances that we have. Here was a daily process. It spoke of spiritual things that we're to offer every day. The sacrifices of thanksgiving, the sacrifices of praise, thanking God for his blood and righteousness. We depend wholly on that. That's what that pointed to. These things pointed to Christ. These, all these sacrifices, these offerings, all of these things pointed to Christ in some manner or another. But to us, to look at this, we'd say, I'm not familiar with that. But we are familiar with Moses was angry, and we are familiar with the law's command. We can pick that out and say, I understand that part. Well, Moses said he sought out. He diligently sought. He looked. He, Moses diligently tried to find. Moses searched carefully for the goat. Moses inquired about the goat, and then we find out they were caught. Moses was angry. They had broken the commandment. And he's speaking to each and every person that has ever been born on the face of this earth. Someone wrote to me the other day, it's just too bad that we don't have people's pants catch on fire when they tell a lie. Liar, liar, pants on fire. I said, we better be glad because the whole world will be aflame. <laughs> That's just the way we are. Well, there is a solution here, though. And this is so glorious that the solution is brought up in verse 19. The law commanded, the law found out, the law found guilty. And here we have verse 19. And Aaron said unto Moses... Now, what relationship did Aaron have with those two boys? He's their daddy. I title this, The Father Got Involved. The Father Got Involved. The Father Steps In. I am so thankful that Aaron, as he overheard what was going on, as he heard Moses, his brother, get angry with his sons, now, I don't know how that affects you. Does it affect you when someone gets after your kids? Aaron stood by, overheard, and then he said, it shares with us he got involved. Now, a great blessing that we find out in the word of God is that the father stepped in on our behalf. The law is angry. The law has com commanded, and we've broken it. And justice, if it was served completely to us, we would face the eternal penalty for that. But the father stepped in. Aaron, it says, if Aaron said unto Moses. Now, I don't understand all that transpired in this. I've read this passage of scripture in several translations, and I walk away and say, I really don't understand what happened because the word says, and Aaron said unto Moses, behold, this day have they offered their sin offering and their burnt offering before the Lord and such things have befallen me. And if I had eaten the sin offering today, should it have been accepted in the sight of the Lord? I'm thankful I don't have to understand everything. I'm thankful I don't have to understand all the word of God. In fact, People who say they know everything about it are in, in a terrible strait. I saw the advertisement for a book, Know Your Bible in 30 Days. I says, 
My goodness, what a preposterous statement. We'll spend all our life reading this and studying this and still have eternity for the Lord to teach us about it. But there are some things that we can understand, and one of them is found in the last verse of this passage of Scripture. And when Moses heard that, he was content. Now, I like that statement. Moses was content with whatever Aaron brought up, and he had the fortitude to step in between the law, Moses, his own brother, and his sons who were brought under the very eye of the law and found guilty before the law, even if they had done it in ignorance. They were guilty before God because of doing this act and not doing part of this act. So the blessing to us is that it is always the father that steps in. The father stepped in for his children. And he does this before eternity began. Would you join me in a book of John chapter 6 for two or three verses of scripture that have to do with the Father and him stepping in? The glories of the Father, as we find the Lord Jesus Christ shares with us the very blessed things. Aaron stepped in between his two sons and the law, in between his two sons and Moses, in between what the condemnation that, Aaron, uh, that Moses was angry and he had made a commandment, and they hadn't followed it, and their mouths are shut, they're stopped before him. There's not one plea, not one thought, not one idea that's recorded about what they thought about this whole thing because their dad stepped in for them. Aaron stepped in between them and the law. Aaron, their father, stepped in between those guilty ones and the law that had found them guilty. And now in John chapter 6, verse 37, a glorious, glorious passage that we find with regard to what the Father did on behalf of his children before time began. He stepped in, before, in for them before they were born. In this passage of scripture, we find Aaron stepping in after his sons are of age and they even have this priestly garments on them. But our Father, stepped in for us before the world began. And it tells us here in verse 37, all that the Father giveth me. Now, what a blessing God has in that very statement for his children. Bulletin article. If you say you believe the Bible and don't believe in election, you don't believe the Bible. <laughs> If God hadn't have stepped in on our behalf before the creation, if he had not made this very good statement on our behalf, we would have never come to him. If he hadn't have taken an interest in us before the world began, we would have never turned in to see him, to view him, to talk to him, to be at friends with him. We would have been eternally lost. People have the idea that they would turn in, and yet the scriptures tell us that we're by nature enmity against God. We don't have the capabilities. We don't have the desire. We think we'll turn in, but we're turning into another God. We're not turning into this God. For in John chapter 6 and verse 17, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. So the father had a dear, blessed interest in a people before the world ever began. And we find that as Aaron stood between the law and his children and spoke up for them in such a capacity, in fact, that Moses was content. To have the law content, we have to have it fulfilled. We have to have it taken care of. We have to have somebody fulfill it on our behalf. We have to have someone take care of it because we can't. We're sinning by breathing. Every second, we're sinning against God. Our very nature is that way. We need someone to take care of that great pile of sin. And that's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ did when he came. He laid down his life, a ransom for many, paid their complete and total sin debt. There will be no charge against us. Who shall lay anything against us? Who shall lay a charge against God's elect? It is God that justifieth. So as we read here, all that the Father giveth me, thank God 
God the Father had an interest in a people before the world began. Because that means sometime in our life, that interest will be revealed to us. He will call us out of darkness to his marvelous light. We will be put in a position to hear the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is Savior that saves and not makes us savable. Somehow, someone's going to travel to our community and we're going to hear him, or we're going to travel to some place where there's somebody that knows something that preaches the gospel and we'll hear it. God has assured that. All right? In John chapter 6 and verse 44, no man can come to me except the Father. One more time, the Father makes us accepted. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. Now, Aaron stood between two boys. They're dumbstruck. Their uncle is mad at them. I don't know if you've ever had that happen to you. Their uncle is mad at them. But more than that, the law is mad at them. And Aaron, overhearing what's going on with his two boys, said, it's time to get involved. And he went over and got involved. And it was such an involvement that when it was over, the law was content. Moses was content. Now, I know what that means. He's not angry anymore. He's been pacified. He's willing to go on. Forget it. These two boys, wrong. They did a wrong. They did two wrongs. They committed a crime, and then they didn't commit a crime. They didn't eat it, and they offered it as a sacrifice. Looks good to us. Looks good to them. Looks good to everybody else. But when the law is involved, God's word must be fulfilled exactly. And there's only one that has the capabilities of doing that. And that's the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. John 6, 45, it says, It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. God is the best teacher. Because his instructions are always correct. I taught school for a number of years, and once in a while when I was teaching, I'd find out that I left some bad information with these students. I read it again, and I said, oh, my goodness, I made a mistake. That's not the problem with God. He never makes a mistake when he's teaching. He always points to his son. There is one issue, and Christ is the issue. There's one issue, and that's the main issue, and that's Christ. And God the Father always points us to the Son. As it says there, as it is written in the prophets, they shall all be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh to me. If you've been taught of the Father, you're going to come to Christ. He's going to draw you to Christ. He's the only Savior. There's none other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. There's only one that has the ability because of his perfection, because he's the Son of God, God the Son, that could have sin imputed to him in such a way that he could take it as far as the east is from the west, pay for it incomplete. No one's going to bill us again for that. John 6, 65. And he said, therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given of him of my father. You know what? The father is glad to give this to those he has given to the son before the foundation of the world. What a delight it is for the father to give us this desire to come. What a delight it is to give us a new heart. What a delight it is to come and be able to be taught of God and come to Christ and not lose our way, to be brought to him in such a complete manner that we rest in God. I love what it said about Solomon's kingdom. It was so peaceful that every man sat under his own vine. I built a little addition on the back of my garage because I like to go out there and read. And my daughter built me a sign that says, the vine. I sit under my vine and I read. What a delight it is to sit peacefully under the vine of God Almighty and rest in Christ 
and know that the Father took care of all the business that was necessary to make me accepted in the beloved. That he, in the covenant of grace, along with the Son and along with the Holy Spirit, has fixed it so that all of his children will be brought in and they will rejoice and be thankful that God has taken care of the challenge that was made against them by the law, which is wrath and does not bring life. It only brings death. But Christ does not bring death. He brings life. It's the opposite. He takes what happened in the fall in the Garden of Eden and completely turns it around and gives us life. There we had darkness. Now we have light. There we have a fall. Now we have a rising. He brings this forth out of the tomb. So God is so good to do this. And then finally in John chapter 17 and verse 11. John chapter 17. Father again. He says, not only will I do this and this and this and this, but I'll do this. John 17, and there in verse 11, and now I am come no more in the world. Excuse me. And now I am no more in the world. John chapter 17 and verse 11. But these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Those sons never quit being Aaron's sons. These children never quit being the father's children. They are kept by his power. They are made sons by grace. They are delivered by the penalty that Christ paid on the cross. They are raised from the spiritual dead and made to be children of God. And he said, and besides all of that, I will keep them to the end. Jesus said, I'll lose none. God the Father says, I'll take care of them. They are my children. And as Job said, I have found a ransom. The Lord Jesus Christ is the ransom. How is the law silenced? It must be obeyed. We find that Jesus Christ did that in his own work and ministry on the cross. He became sin for us in such a capacity that he put away all sin of all of his children. And we can read then. And when Moses heard that, he was content. There's no better feeling for a believer than to know the law has no more hang on me. It's all been paid for. If the law has been paid for, it can't have a charge against us anymore. It's been paid for by Christ. And Moses could walk away and say, okay, that's enough. That's fine with me. I'm happy. Whatever they did, whatever you find there, whatever they did, we can look at the end and say, Moses was content. And when Moses was content, you know what? God is content. He's content with his children. He's content with the proceedings. He's content with all that's gone on. He's at peace. And when he's at peace, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Moses heard that, he was 